This episode is brought to you by Toku. If you are planning to launch a token, already have a live token, are granting employees or contractors vesting token awards, or are just trying to figure out how to take care of taxable token events for your team, from easy to use token grant award templates through tracking vesting to managing tax withholdings, make it simple today with Toku. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Empire. We have a very timely episode today. Uh, today, we're recording this on the day that uh, uh, some Bitcoin ETF news kind of spiked the market, and then it turned out not to be true. So we have Matt Hogan, uh, CIO of Bitwise, and Hunter, uh, CEO, co-founder of Bitwise. Jens, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Excited to be here. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so, I mean, how's, I got to ask, like, how's today been? I feel like uh, Cointelegraph put out this news that Bitcoin ETF, or was it the ETF? Yeah, Bitcoin ETF is here and the market pumped and it turned out not to be true. So, yeah, well, I mean, how was today? What happened? Man, I'll, uh, I'll answer that and then Hunter can build on. Sometimes you wake up in this industry and you just want to shake your head. Uh, this is uh, unfortunate. It's fortunate that I got corrected quickly, right? Got corrected within... 30 minutes. Uh, but man, uh, you, you, you do hate to see this. You know, it's probably some low level uh, newer reporter who misunderstood something and posted something, but you get this massive reaction in the market. I do think, you know, this is a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a pre-roll of what we're going to see uh, in the future. I do think we're on the pathway. I'm optimistic we're on the pathway towards the spot Bitcoin ETF, as you guys know. Um, but we really didn't need this this morning. This is not what I wanted to wake up to on Monday morning. I don't know about Hunter. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think uh, the crypto community rightly is fascinated with the filings and the filing process for ETFs. We run a, an ETF news bulletin service uh, through our website where we keep people updated. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for knowing when things will happen, but it's also a very technical and uh, narrow subject matter, the, the filing process. And I think sometimes uh, people misinterpret things. So um, I think that was the story today, but, uh, but hmm. glad it, the, uh, the loop was closed pretty quickly. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of shorts got wiped out, huh? <laughs> <laughs> One or two. One or two. <laughs> Not great. Matt, I actually wanted to start um, uh, pre-crypto land. Uh, one of my favorite things to talk about with you is, and for those who don't know, Matt's been a longtime advisor to BlockWorks. Um, Matt, one of the things I love to talk about with you is just you ran ETFs.com, right? Pre, Pre-crypto pre days. And I love to almost hear from you about like the mainstreamization of ETFs, not the Bitcoin ETF, but ETFs, because I was, uh, when, you, when you pull up old news articles, right? Some of these headlines, Financial Times called ETFs weapons of mass destruction, I was reading something, you will be able to explain this much better to me, but they, folks thought there was going to be this liquidity doom loop uh, and that e ETFs could take down the bond market. So can you just maybe talk talk to us about like the early days of ETFs and what similarities you see to just Bitcoin ETFs and what's happening today? Yeah, that's exactly right. Even more than that, there were congressional hearings literally about ETFs destroying American entrepreneurialism and ending the American dream. Uh, as you mentioned, they were weapons of mass destruction. They were called EFTs. No one knew what they were. And yeah, this liquidity uh, doom loop. I mean, to, to back up, what an ETF is, is an evolution of financial technology. So for 100 years, people invested through mutual funds that allowed them to access the market once a day and that created this sort of shared collective experience of taxation. If we all own mutual funds and you sold, Jason, I would pay the taxes on that uh, at the end of the year. This is a, a ridiculous idea, but this was the best technology they could develop in 1920. And nothing improved it until the early 90s when they came up with this idea of an ETF. And an ETF was threatening to a huge chunk of the financial services industry, right? There were massive companies built on traditional mutual funds. There were massive companies built on trading bonds, which trade over the phone and not on a screen. And an ETF threatened all that. And then, you know, for, for two reasons, people were very worried about it. One, I think because it was so disruptive, because it was going to slash margins and profits and prices. And then two, because it was new and people didn't know exactly how it would turn out, people were hugely skeptical of it. 
And they were skeptical of it, not just for a year or two years, not just through one stress test or two stress tests. They were skeptical of it for 20 years. I am not joking. You know, we see the crypto industry hauled before Congress and made to answer questions about the fundamentals of crypto. We see Congress people asking ridiculous questions and, and talking about Bitcom and mispronouncing names. All of that is a replay to me of what we saw. We saw Congress people haul BlackRock in front of, uh, of congressional hearings and talk about this liquidity doom loop that could end the bond market and throw millions out of work. Uh, we saw you know, the head of, of, of the Qs and Invesco and leading lawyers come before and be asked about, you know, isn't this robbing small companies of the ability to come to market? It was absolutely absurd. And then you fast forward today and it's the mother's milk of investing. It's how literally almost every American gets access to the market today. It's a $7 trillion industry. No one questions it. Every major company has come on board. And I think we're going to go through the same journey on crypto, right? Huge amount of skepticism. We're starting to see that turn. I think we're at that moment. You're starting to see BlackRock wanting to launch a spot Bitcoin ETF, Invesco launching a spot Bitcoin ES, UBS tokenizing bonds. We're seeing that change. In two or three years, there'll be no more congressional hearings. People will be just talking about how much uh, more efficient this made the market. So history always repeats and it's repeating with crypto. Can you give us a little bit of, for, for folks that are not familiar, I mean, the ETF um, discussion has been around for multiple years uh, and it's constantly been uh, uh, dismissed by the SEC for a variety of reasons, but I think there's a common denominator and maybe it would love for you to go into kind of the reasons why the SEC says, hey, look, the market's pretty premature. There's a whole host of reasons why they deny these applications. Uh, so maybe if you could just give us a little bit of context for listeners, it'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's worth noting that the first spot Bitcoin ETF application was filed on July 1st, 2013. And if we're being honest, the market was not ready for a spot Bitcoin ETF in July of 2013. There were no institutional custodians. There were no trading firms that could make markets in it. And the market was more subject to manipulation than it is today. So for the first, let's say, five or six or seven years, the SEC had reasonable cause to deny a spot Bitcoin ETF. They've been focused specifically on this question of market manipulation. And to be a little bit more precise, in order to approve an ETF, the SEC wants to be able to look at the market and surveil for market manipulation. So if someone tries to monkey with the price, they can figure out who did it and prosecute it and therefore reduce the likelihood of market manipulation. So uh, in the stock market, if someone tries to manipulate the market, they can ask the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ who profited from this trade and shut it down. In, in the crude oil market, if someone tries to manipulate the price of crude oil, they can see who is trading crude oil futures and prosecute that. And the idea is that that reduces the likelihood of market manipulation. The challenge in crypto is for a long time, there was no one you could ask who is on the other side of these trades profiting from this issue. The reason the argument in favor of a spot Bitcoin ETF is now so strong is you have people to surveil. You can surveil the CME Bitcoin futures market. Firms like BlackRock are looking for surveillance sharing agreements with Coinbase. This market is just much more institutional than it was in 2013. Or honestly, even when we started pushing for a spot Bitcoin ETF, which was back in 2018 and 2019, the market has come a long way. And I think those manipulation concerns um, are now solved, in my view. Uh, and we'll see if the SEC agrees in the coming months. When you look at a day like today where there's fake news of, of an ETF approval and, and there's uh, you know $100 million of long and shorts being liquidated in a span of a couple of minutes, you look at that and say that's definitely... You know, someone, whether it was a stupid intern or actually something more behind that, time and time again, we do wonder if there is a coordinated action amongst crypto whales, if you will. Now, a lot of that is hard to prove, but I think you have tools at your disposal, like Chainalysis and others that can allow you to kind of trace. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a transparent ledger anyone can inspect. So presumably you'd be able to understand <clears throat> who and how this manipulation is taking place. But the thing that I want to get your take on is this is an international market, uh, whereas an ETF, as we think about it in the US, is just kind of 
you know, I guess there are international participants, but everything is settling kind of in a, in the more, I don't know, controlled environment, if you will, whereas the crypto markets are 24-7, 365 everywhere. Does that worry the SEC? Is that because, or, or is that not, does that, does that not compute? It, 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 it makes sense that they would be worried about it, but it's important to note two things. One is that all markets are subject to this sort of action, right? So you can see in the equity market, uh, people putting out fake press releases about mergers and prices going up. You can see news in the gold or oil market that leads to prices that turns out not to be true. So this, this happens. And I think that that point about the gold or oil market uh, is directly analogous here, right? The SEC doesn't have perfect purview over the gold market, which you know trades on on Forty Seventh Street, trades in London, trades in India and in retail settings. They can't penetrate all of that. But the reason they've allowed a spot Bitcoin ETF to approve is even though there may be these micro inefficiencies in the market, the big market is mature enough that you can surveil it, right? You can look at the Comex Gold futures market. You can have confidence in the London spot fixing price. And even if there's things on the edges, the market as a whole is okay. And I think that's true with Bitcoin as well. Like even if you can't see through to every small startup exchange, the market as a whole now has this, uh, this surface level of institutionalization. The CME Bitcoin futures market is large and established. You mentioned Chainalysis lets you penetrate down the market. There's AML KYC at major spot exchanges. And uh, and so it doesn't have to be perfect to allow a spot Bitcoin ETF to exist. It just needs to meet their requirements. And I think we're at the point where it does. What is it? What is uh, the introduction of spot ETFs actually do to an industry? And Matt, picking on you a lot here for, for the ETF questions. But Hunter, I want to get to you on some financial advisor questions in a second. But <laughs> Matt, what, one more to you is so you're running ETF.com just a couple of years after uh, the, the first gold ETF was introduced, right? I think that was 2004. You're running ETF.com and I think 2007, 8, 9, 10, 15, you know, for a couple of yeah. years then. What, what does it actually do to an industry and to a market um, and almost to like a market structure to have an ETF int- introduced? 100%. And I was writing about ETFs even before the spot gold ETF and talking about it, giving speeches. It completely transforms the industry. I actually think people understate the long-term impact of a spot Bitcoin ETF on the market. And I'll give you the gold analogy. Today, we all think of gold as this deeply institutional asset. Like without peer, it's almost the most institutional asset. Oh, if we can only have gold in the portfolio, there's nothing more solid, nothing more established, nothing more suits and ties and bankers than gold. But before the spot Bitcoin ETF, That really, really deeply wasn't true. Gold was the land of tinfoil hats and crazy people, you know, stockpiling baked beans and guns and putting gold bars underneath their mattress. It was not held by mainstream institutions. You wouldn't have pensions having conversations with gold. There were no mutual funds that allowed you to get exposure to gold. There were almost no gold mining funds. You couldn't bring it up in 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 common conversation. There were tiny gold conferences that were attended mostly by retail investors where people were excited about Krugerrands and uh, and different coins. Uh, and then you had a gold ETF and all of a sudden, over a period of about three to four years, it transformed into what it is today, which is this institutional asset. The other thing that happened, uh, and this is no guarantee that this will happen in Bitcoin, but the price of gold went up 11 years in a row which it had never done in modern history. Uh, You can go back as far as you can in modern pricing, at least in US dollars, and you won't find an 11 year string. And the reason was over that 11 year span, $100 billion flowed into those gold ETFs. And it didn't disrupt the other demand for gold. People often wonder if a spot Bitcoin ETF will disrupt retail demand for Bitcoin through other means. That's not what gold shows us. Investment into gold bars, investment in gold jewelry stayed the same, and you just added this institutional piece on top. Uh, So it really can be transformative for an asset class. I think it will be transformative for Bitcoin. I think there will be a before ETF and a post ETF. And even though it will take a few years, I think people underestimate the impact a few years from now of what this will do to the market. Hmm. 
What about on the demands? All right, so what that gold story tells you 11 years in a row is that there was just a gross uh, market mi- mispricing due to a lack of a vehicle, basically, that yep. gave investors. So maybe, Hunter, this is the time to throw it to you. You're, I know you're in a... So you, I see you posting on LinkedIn about about all your meetings and stuff with financial advisors and institutions and RIAs. I'd love for you to almost take Santi and I into the room with these folks uh, because there's there are a lot of reasons not to buy crypto right now or not to buy Bitcoin. It's there's FTX or maybe there's Tether FUD or there's Binance FUD or there's regulatory reasons and Bitcoin ETF or lack of an ETF is probably just another one of those reasons. What are can you just take us into those conversations and cover as much as you want to cover here? Yeah, abs- absolutely. My, my my pleasure to do that. We we love spending time with with clients. Bitwise, as you know, uh, works to help uh, investment professionals understand and access the opportunities in crypto. So you see my my posts on uh, on LinkedIn about uh, about doing that. Maybe maybe uh, it was the Barons Conference a few weeks ago. Uh, the the way to imagine the investment professional generally in this moment is that they have ninety nine problems and crypto is just one of them. So for all of us in crypto, I think the four of us included, we spend a lot of time and it's our job to spend time understanding the day-to-day developments, the trajectory, what uh, each development means for the opportunity set and the thesis. But for most of our clients, they're overseeing portfolios of every asset class. It could be you know, stocks, bonds, international markets, alternatives, real estate. Uh, venture, private equity, et cetera. And those markets uh, are undergoing a lot of change right now, both in the outlook because of macro concerns about inflation and recessions, um, and uh, also uh, because uh, just year to date, the performance has been confusing to many, and they're not sure if they should go risk on. Should they be buying the NASDAQ when it's up 30% year to date, or should they be selling it? So they have those questions on the investment side. Uh, to re- to wrestle with, and then depending on the type of investment professional, if you're an institution, then this may not be the case. If you're a financial advisor, wealth manager, you're also thinking about your practice, your cl- your conversations with clients, uh, growing your practice, and so between those two things, you have a a pretty busy slate day to day, and I think that's sort of an essential backdrop to imagine when you imagine the conversation that we have with clients who are thinking about the space, they have it on a to-do list, is just to you know, think about the fact that the to-do list is very long. Uh, how do those conversations actually go? So I'll give you, I'll give you a few stories. I was with uh, uh, an advisor who's at a billion dollar plus uh, RA, which is an independent uh, advisory firm. That's what that, that term refers to, not associated with a bank or a broker dealer. And they uh, manage about a uh, billion dollars in assets. Um, and that's been growing a lot. And they're really excited about that. They're wrestling with clients wanting to meet over Zoom versus in person, uh, if they should be expanding their footprint to different, different uh, states. Um, but one of the principals of that firm a few years ago uh, attended a, a talk that we gave uh, on crypto and saw the unique opportunity for their clients to put a low correlation and high growth potential asset into the portfolios um, and the unique role that that could play, both through an academic lens uh, and through a client lens. Um, and so over time, they built a 2% sleeve uh, across all clients. They use one of our, our products uh, for that sleeve uh, and then rely on us for, for research on the space. But they're sort of on one end of the spectrum where they have built things out, um, they have addressed sort of the crypto opportunity and now they're trying to stay up to date with what's happening in the market, um, but have only so much time for that. So they want to know when there's something important that they need to understand. On the other end of the spectrum, we have, you know, we have thousands of conversations per quarter. And I think uh, for many advisors, the state of play in crypto is um, it's interesting, but we don't have time to do something right now, or the way that this is sometimes expressed is we're we're waiting to see what happens with the spot Bitcoin ETF, which is the same as saying we're waiting we're waiting a little bit longer uh, to see. Are you actually hearing from them? Like we are waiting for an ETF to put money, or is the demand really dried up? Because yeah, I'm just sort of curious how much like demand and 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 capital is there chomping up, like just on the sidelines waiting for the ETF. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, a great question. I think it probably comes up in a fourth to a third of our client conversations. The demand and prospective demand uh, is hmm. massive. I think it'll be the most important development uh, the industry has had uh, for traditional investment professionals because of the benefits that the ETF wrapper provides, uh, the regulatory benefits and, and comfort uh, with compliance and disclosures, as well as the simplicity. Uh, each of these firms is operating on a stack of trading, reporting, uh, accounting, compliance, and so on and so forth that is really well suited to the ETF wrapper, uh, for which a lot of other wrappers are a bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think it'll be a breakthrough moment. Matt, is there anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add one important piece of context, which is if you want to think about wealth in America, you should think about it in three buckets. There's sort of self-directed retail, people trading on their own. There's financial advisors, people helping other people invest. And there's institutional capital, pensions and endowments. And the breakdown of wealth is about 20% self-directed, 40% advisors, and 40% institutions. And if you think about crypto going from zero to a trillion dollars, it's been built almost entirely on that left bucket, the self-directed retail investors, the smallest bucket by far. And it maybe isn't fully penetrated there, but it's, it's made some penetration. But these other two buckets are either you know, single digits in terms of their growth. And what, it, what an ETF will do is it will allow those two other buckets, 80% of the market, to gravitate up to where self-directed retail is. And that's why it's so important. It's just a scale game. We talk so much about these self-directed retail investors because they're loud. There's a lot of media coverage of them, but they're really the smallest segment of the market. Most of the money is in these other two buckets, which is what the ETF serves. Who are like the biggest winners in the event of an approval of an ETF? I mean, you have obviously a custodian like Coinbase. You have multiple different players. You have you guys that have an index. Like, I'm just sort of curious how you think about obviously grayscale which you know if you look at the premium like historically it traded these products gbtc eth and others traded at a premium and that was for me i just read into that that that's just a convenience factor that people just want to kind of they're willing to trade illiquidity and pay a premium because they don't want to do it themselves they don't want to self custody they don't want to set up and spin up a full operation uh now of course that's trading at a discount but compressing so i'm curious how you think about like the shifting kind of tectonic plates, once you have an approval of an ETF, what does that do to the existing kind of players, including you guys uh, going forward? I, I, I just want to uh, uh, build on something that you, you just said, Santiago, uh, around the, the role of, of a product like GBTC, because I think it, it, it reemphasizes a, a point here that is very helpful to understanding why an ETF is so important. For Matt laid out the different constituents, for many constituents in capital markets writ large, there's actually, it's not just convenient, it's that there's no alternative. If you're a financial advisor, you cannot open a Coinbase account for a client. So if you want to support a client getting exposure, if you want to take care of that for them, the same way you're taking care of uh, emerging markets and growth and real estate and munis and their financial plan and their taxes and their reporting, um, if you want to embrace crypto as part of that, and sometimes clients ask for it or demand it, you don't have a way of buying uh, a Bitcoin directly, by and large. Of course, we have SMAs and a few other things today that are becoming possible. But historically, uh, these publicly traded products and their ETFs as well now um, are the only way. So uh, I would just, I think you, you, you said the right thing there, and I would just even dial it up further from convenience to um, only, only option in many cases. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons and, and, and a reason that sometimes people underestimate the size of the breakthrough here, um, because it's not just going from, uh, good to better or good to more convenient, but, but actually going from, uh, in some cases, not possible to possible. Um, and that's, uh, that's a big deal. Um, as, as to the question about, uh, who the winners are, I think one of the reasons that, I mean, we, we've been in the space for, six or seven years now um, and have tried to be good stewards of the space and um, and of course play our role in, in helping people understand it and its merits. I think that one of the reasons it's so exciting to see the whole industry uh, sort of rally around an effort like uh, a Bitcoin ETF, which we've been working on for a very long time, is that I think that uh, almost the entire industry and investor base will benefit from this development. 
It does a lot to uh, bring credibility and uh, maturation to the space. There you go. You got the thumbs up uh, uh, rearing its head there. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's let's yeah. see it. Let's yeah. see it. This is your this is your trigger to go watch on YouTube, folks. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, I think it does a lot to 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 build that that comfort that people can participate in a in a mature and mainstream way, um, which enhances the credibility of the whole of the whole industry. I think, of course, all all of the parties involved in managing these products, be it the issuers like Bitwise, uh, custodians like Coinbase. Um, even administrators like Bank of New York Mellon, who will be you know, the administrator on funds, or New York Stock Exchange, which would be our listing venue, uh, all benefit. Um, and then investors benefit uh, hugely. Existing investors who took the harder path of getting access before um, it sort of unlocked for a broader set of investors. And then, of course, new investors who can really benefit from the low correlation, uh, the high growth potential. Um, but haven't had uh, a workable way of incorporating that. So uh, I know it's it's not the most so, sort of intriguing answer, but I think it's the reason that there's so much uh, unified um, enthusiasm for this development is that I think it's a, it's a tide that will lift uh, lift the whole industry. Much like Matt mentioned, the first gold ETF in 2004 really did a lot to uh, uh, lift the maturation of, of that space as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course. Uh- Go ahead, Matt. I don't know if you wanted. Oh, I was just going to build on that. One, one, one maybe uh, nuance on top of that. There, there's some people who think the large companies will come in uh, from traditional finance and and win the space in this new, more mature market. And uh, I think they'll get their fair share. It is worth noting that historically, that's not what tends to happen. To go back to the ETF example, uh, Jason, in the early days of the ETF, it was developed by a company called Barclays Global Investors. And they became the dominant player, eventually got acquired by BlackRock. When we talk about BlackRock leading ETFs today, it's because they bought this small shop that managed really very little money called Barclays that came up with this idea and grew it substantially. The other winners were were firms like PowerShares or State Street Global Advisors, which is part of a big company, but not a giant player. Uh, And in ETF land, that is true. Often in these niche markets, you see the large companies come in, but it's the specialists that uh, that more than hold their ground. So I think Hunter is right. It will benefit everyone. It will benefit the ecosystem, uh, mm-hmm. both both the existing specialist players and the the larger financial firms that are coming in. Have you have you guys ever been approached by someone like a J.P. Morgan or a BlackRock for an acquisition? We 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 have we have relationships with with lots of uh, uh, large traditional firms and. Um, Find, find that to be productive. But uh, my viewpoint is that to uh, play the most productive role for our clients, having a full-time focus on crypto is imperative. As you guys know, so much happens in a 24-hour span. Clients have a very limited aperture of time, but need to know the important things that are happening. And so the confidence that comes from having a partner like Bitwise who's looking at the space 24 seven um, and is always week to week there to talk about it, uh, I think is the essential element. Um, a challenge that traditional firms have is of course, they need to be talking to clients about short duration income this week and how the yield curve is developing. And that is actually in many cases or most cases, the most important thing that they need to be talking to their clients about. Um, and there's a prioritization challenge when you when you take that and then, of course, you add to it what's happening in commercial real estate right now. Are there any developments there? Is private credit something that I should be prioritizing? What's what's the, the house view on venture? Should I be in value or should I be pushing out and tilting towards growth? Uh, all of those questions are imperative for a broader portfolio in which crypto is a one to five percent allocation. So if you're an investment professional, how do you surround yourself with a set of relationships that is going to uh, make sure that you have a, a vector into everything you need to know. And I think a reason that we have uh, been able to lead in this category uh, and our client base has over doubled in the last 18 months, um, uh, the information is not, not public generally, but I, I suspect we have the broadest client base of investment professionals in, in America today, uh, is because people value knowing for certain that we will always be monitoring the latest in crypto and they can tap into that at any moment in time 
and we're ever we're never going to not talk about something important because we had some other priority. Yeah, I'm just curious. Like, okay, so we have the ETF. Uh, the SEC had until yesterday to uh, dismiss, or I guess what's the right word, appeal uh, one of the applications, and they didn't. Now there was a couple of folks that said, "Whoa, okay, this means that at some point between now and January Q1, like there will be an approval." I my understanding is that's not it's not as straightforward. They can find other reasons not to approve an ETF. Um, although maybe on the margin they're running out of they're running out of reasons. But um I am curious as you guys think about that, just is it true? Um how do you kind of see the that path unfolding for the approval? Um and any perhaps potential reasons why the SEC may not uh, or continue to reject these applications. Yeah, sure. I, I can jump in. We, of course, can't talk about Bitwise's application or any application, but we can talk generally about the space. Um, it is the case that the way to think of this grayscale lawsuit and the focus on market manipulation is that that's necessary, but not sufficient to allow an ETF to come to market. So it's a hurdle you have to clear, but there are other hurdles you also have to clear. Some of those hurdles have to do with custody and how you store Bitcoin. Some of them have to do with uh, trading and how you acquire Bitcoin. And then some have to do with disclosures and other items. So there are these, these other hurdles that uh, issuers have to jump over. But it is worth noting that you have a large number of issuers uh, from very reputable firms focused on this space. Uh, and so, so I'm optimistic that we'll get there, much more optimistic than I've been at any other time uh, during our, our five-year journey. But there's no guarantee. There is no guarantee that we will we will get there by January 10th, which is the date that the ARC fund has to be approved. And many people uh, think they'll line up all the funds. There's no guarantee we'll get there by March, which is when most of the applications have to be approved. Uh, there's no guarantee that we'll get there at all. But I am optimistic. And I think the balance of arguments is on the side of, of, mm -hmm. of pushing this over the line, which would be great, as Hunter mentioned, for investors. Yeah. There is a criticism on just generally ETFs, and Matt, you correct me here, but that, that there's this idea that the in general markets have become complacent and you have huge firms that just most of the capital that ends up in acquiring a substantial ownership in these companies is very passive. Um, you're, you're not voting, you're not paying attention to uh, what's happening. Whereas before ETFs, there was more direct relationship with the owner, there was more perhaps oversight of managers, principal agent problem, yada, yada, yada. There is a contingent within the space that says ETFs have actually been damaging to corporate governance and generally how these companies are managed. I am curious uh, when you apply that lens and argument to crypto in a world where there's a lot of ETFs, um, you do certainly shift more towards a centralized version of ownership of these things. Um, and when as it relates to proof of stake, even worse, right? Because then there is uh, even more centralization of the particular token that needs to be staked. So I am curious how you think about that. One, do you actually agree with that argument that ETFs can can lead to that kind of complacency in the market? And how does that apply to crypto in a kind of a steady state where there's a bunch of ETFs? Yeah, great question. Uh, the first part, the answer is no. It's one of those seductive arguments. Because if you take it to its extremes, of course it is true. If 100% of the equity market is passively managed, then there is no governance and no incentive to, to innovate and there's potentials for collusion. In fact, when the first uh, index fund launched in the 1970s, there was this huge advertising campaign calling index funds un-American. So this argument has been around for 50 years. It, 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 it fails as long as there's a sufficient portion of the market that is actively engaged in the product, right? So uh, while it's true at 100%, it's probably not true at 50%, it's probably not even true at 80 or 90% because the active sleeve will still have that incentive to profit from being uh, aggressive and managing it. Um, on, on the governance side, uh, yeah, I, I just don't, uh, it, it's again seductive because at 100%, it would be absolutely true. But I just don't think that's the way the market will 
mature. There's nothing about an ETF that prevents people from owning Bitcoin directly, that prevents them from owning their own keys. And it's a little bit like those arguments that the crypto industry is uh, too concentrated today that assume that a wallet that belongs to Coinbase represents one owner, when in fact it represents uh, millions. And that will be true in the ETF space as well. So um, yeah, a seductive argument, but, uh, but not one that I think holds water uh, in the real world. This episode is brought to you by Toku. Toku makes implementing global token compensation and incentive awards simple. With Toku, you get unmatched tax and legal support to grant and administer your global team's tokens. From easy to use token grant award templates through token vesting to managing tax withholdings, Toku understands every grant structure, token purchase agreements, restricted token awards, restricted token units, token options, token appreciation rights, and even phantom tokens. Tokens. For legal, finance, and HR teams, it is a huge, complex task to have to comply with global regulations around compensating people with tokens, not to mention the payroll, tax obligations, tax reporting in every country that you employ someone. It is difficult, time consuming, manual, and costly, and it is drawing more and more attention from regulators and governments. Toku makes this simple for leading teams across the space, protocol labs, DY. IDX Foundation, Mina Foundation, Hedera, Gnosis, Safe, Gitcoin, and a lot more. Reach out to Toku at toku.com forward slash empire or click the link in the description. Yeah, I mean, you have right now in crypto, uh, a lot of de like delegators, right? People can, or validators and people, most of the people are delegating, right? And if you look at Ethereum, like Lido, for instance, has 30-ish, 37, 33% of all Ethereum, um, being delegated to their network of, you know, uh, uh, validators. Um, as it relates to corporate governance, like if you could just refresh our memory, like if you own a ETF and you want to get involved in, you know, there's a annual shareholder meeting of uh, Walmart and you, you have a particularly strong opinion on how they should do X or Y or the director that the directors that are being, correct me here, but, most of the time, or if not all ETFs, allow you to submit the vote, um, or do they withhold some some of that and then they they vote on the behalf of kind of the constituent base? And then, of course, how does that kind of translate into crypto, right? Yeah, the the answer is it's changing. In the past, it was it was held exclusively through uh, through the asset manager, and now through the application of various. Uh, uh, sort of fintech technologies and solutions, you're getting more pass-through voting and more individualized holding. It's a solvable problem that's being solved actively in the market. And I suspect the same thing would be true mm -hmm. in the crypto market. But the yeah. overwhelmingly important thing uh, is that people who are frustrated with the position that these centralized entities are, are taking can simply sell and redeem and then buy it directly themselves. Right, and with, with some tax implications, so there's a, on the margin some, you know, un, you know, disincentive, if you will. But to yeah. be sure, yes, to be sure, that's that's it's absolutely true. And if you thought that these ETFs were going to vacuum up eighty percent of the Bitcoin in the world, again, I think you you might you might be worried about this. But in reality, what this is going to do is it's going to capture a sleeve of Bitcoin from owners who are you know probably not prepared to take active governance positions. Uh, and and uh, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a theoretical concern, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. admit that, but it's not one that practically concerns me, right? The Bitcoin I, community is strong. I would also just chime in, chime in with a perspective that uh, I think it, it will be a huge boon for the space to have more and more assets uh, with a long only asset manager like Bitwise through vehicles like ETFs. If you think about the very productive role that Coinbase plays as a steward and a tentpole for the industry, uh, advocating and investing in its long-term health um, and in its development, um, a long only product, so a product that doesn't make active investment decisions, doesn't go, doesn't go short, um, is structurally aligned with the space's health and um, progress uh, over time and has a very long-term time horizon, isn't necessarily thinking about 
three month windows or six month windows or even year long windows. So I think that uh, in a subtle way, one of the real benefits as as long only asset managers or long bias asset managers uh, accumulate larger and larger uh, stakes on behalf of their clients is uh, our incentive is absolutely to support the development of the ecosystem and the flourishing uh, and maturation of the ecosystem. Uh, we do that in a number of ways, but I think that having more um, more sort of uh, tent poles like that for the space will be a very productive thing in the mm -hmm. same way you've seen Coinbase be so productive even outside of just its day-to-day -day business in the role that it plays in advocating for the space. Yeah. Can we talk about, um, you know, maybe as a someone that is listening to this conversation might be skeptical and say, hey, you know, you've had all these blow-ups. You've had exchanges or folks like BlockFi and Voyager and that have, for a variety of reasons, blown up. And then the, the skepticism might be, well, what happens and how do you prove that, you know, it's uh, whoever's, you know, operating said ETF is actually managing keys correctly and setting up a secure infrastructure and using a, you know, registered or, you know, custodian, if you will, and maybe has insurance and has proof of reserves. Like, I assume all of this is part of the application process. Like you, you need to kind of show, uh, your competency and the service providers that you're using, but there, there's still like the tail risk as it relates to kind of generating enough entropy and managing your keys. Like there is a risk of, you know, uh, someone being hacked and then, Oh, you know, all of a sudden investors are at a loss there and there's very limited insurance in the space still. So maybe it's kind of a wild goose chase where it's not, not that much of a problem, but I'm curious if you believe kind of what your opinion is on on, on that. Yeah, I, I, I can jump in. Hunter can build on it. It, it. It's it's a reasonable question. It's worth noting that ETFs have existed in crypto around the world for a large number of years in Scandinavia, in Germany, in Canada, in Brazil, in other markets, successfully stewarding investor capital. Uh, it is these well-regulated, well-documented entities that have to go through multiple approval processes uh, that have regulation in place that provides the safety that investors want. And it's actually the case conversely that the inability for crypto native entities in the past to access traditional financial services has led to many of the blowups that we've had in the past. So this is uh, strictly a positive development from my point of view in terms of the safety of the products that investors can access. And, uh, and yes, of course, there's a huge amount of work and discussions to go through in order to set up these investment vehicles uh, that help build that trust and secure and make it very real. Yeah. I mean, I guess you see these blowups, right? Uh, there's like, there's a ton of commodities out there where like, you know, JP Moore is buying copper or nickel and it turns out to be like, not, not even <laughs> real. <laughs> like, I mean, it's like an edge case, but you know, there's always a risk, but to your, your points are really good one, which is on the margin, like what's better, the existing, lack of an ETF or with an ETF, well, for all, most most of the time, you're going to be better off using an ETF product because the, the reality is that most people are not sophisticated enough uh, to kind of do it themselves. I would, just, uh, I, would just, I would just add to it. And Santiago, I also want to say, these are fantastic questions. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really actually really, really enjoying, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with ETF as a concept, but haven't pulled back the, the layers uh, like you're doing in Matt knows it better than anyone, so so uh, I think great questions. I, I think when 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 you think about the benefits from a peace of mind and security perspective with an ETF, there's actually a bunch of of layers that stack on top of each other um, that really results in something that allows an investor to say, "I want exposure to crypto, and and I can sigh a bit of relief that I don't have to to worry week to week that uh, it's going to disappear or blow up." Just to just to illustrate some of those those layers, and uh, on our website we have a page called the Professional Approach um, that details some of these. But uh, you have uh, a qualified custodian, which means a custodian with regulatory oversight. Um, you then have uh, an administrator, so a third party in the case of an ETF, Bank of New York Mellon, as an example, who will go in and mark the value of those assets via a, a, a published uh, uh, methodology for how they're valuing those assets that is described in detail uh, in the prospectus. 
Then you have an auditor who will confirm that the administrator and the assets were described accurately. Then on top of that, you have an issuer who is overseeing all of this and can actively take action and intervene if there is any development that needs to be addressed. Um, we did that uh, you know, over the course of, of managing um, assets uh, for the past six years. We've, uh, I think, have a great track record of um, navigating these situations, avoiding FTX, BlockFi, Genesis, Luna, BNB, FTT. Um, so then you have the, the issuer. Then uh, a layer up from that, you have uh, the sort of regulatory piece. You have the disclosures. So you have the requirements of an ETF to disclose risks, to disclose financial reporting, um, and all of those things stack together. Uh, the, uh, and, and I think that that picture as a whole is really important. When you think about stories like the developments uh, uh, and some of the claims about FTX, it's not just that they necessarily um, uh, lost the password or something, right? There, there, there was a potential misrepresentation, um, mm -hmm. not enough uh, third-party eyes or audits on the information. And I think with an ETF, you not only get uh, the best regulated uh, service providers and solutions, but you also get the benefit of many eyes on the information and what's happening across that whole stack that I just described. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is in, again, an idiosyncratic and subtle way, a huge benefit um, to the protection that an investor can have. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, Matt and I think others say that uh, an ETF would be um, an amazing benefit to American investors because yeah. it offers that combination of, uh, of protection layers that um, can be really useful in a space like crypto and in general. Yeah, I mean, certainly like a lot of, we know a lot of retail just holds other coins and exchanges and uh, in traditional finance, that's not the case. Like there's there's clearly more divisions of all the different kind of components when you're when you're buying and then you're custodian. And, and, and so anyways, yeah, certainly like it would be much safer. I think we could all agree if, if they held an ETF. Now, the reality is um, we're likely going to go baby steps here. Uh, maybe uh, I'm curious what you think of the sequence, Bitcoin first, then Ethereum. Ethereum has a, a little bit more complications because of the yield and the stake and, and, and perhaps some liquidity component attached to that. But like um, in ETF land, I think you saw a similar progression. Now you see all kinds of flavors of ETFs. Uh, you know, you go 3x long rates and 3x long a particular sector. And there's just uh, a very uh, sort of a plethora um, of, of products how do you think this space evolves? What's the sequence and timeline of the type of ETFs that we may see kind of in a year from now, three years from now, five, 10 years from now? And, and, and I kind of want to ask that because you guys have, if I look at the progression of the type of products you've offered over the years, it's, it's been, it's been interesting to observe. You try to compose kind of certain indices and um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious how you think about that. Maybe I, I could comment on on our, our point of view, and Matt, you could maybe share a little bit about specific uh, products that you mentioned. Santiago, I think it's a great question. Just just to zoom out for a second on on Bitwise's point of view, uh, our view, as I've sort of described, is that investment professionals have very limited time for the space, not because they're disinterested, but because they have so many responsibilities. And for us to be the best partner to them, we need to work to make sure that whenever there's a a uh, useful way of accessing the space that we are bringing that forth so that they have the opportunity to consider it and benefit from it. So if you look at the history of, of Bitwise, uh, we got started in 2017 with a private crypto index fund. And since then, every time we've seen an opportunity to benefit clients and investors through a wrapper or a strategy, we've brought that forth. So uh, we launched the first publicly traded crypto index fund we launched the first Crypto Innovators Equity ETF. We launched the first DeFi index fund, the first NFT, blue chip NFT index fund. Um, just uh, two or three weeks ago, we brought to market the first Ethereum linked uh, ETFs. Um, so Matt can comment on the specific uh, products, but I think at, at this point, we have a six year track record of showing that if there is a useful new aperture, um, be it an ETF wrapper or a strategy, 
Um, our point of view on it is that we will be working with uh, the SEC or other relevant parties to make sure that we are, we're bringing that forward for investors to consider. Um, and to your point, there are some interesting interesting things on the table. Recently, the Ethereum linked ETFs that became possible and, uh, and then the spot products that we're uh, in dialogue around uh, now. Yeah. Matt, do you have yeah, I, I, I could just build on that. I think that's right. Towards the specific products, you know, if we are on the pathway to get a spot Bitcoin ETF, I think it's reasonable to assume that an Ethereum spot ETF is down that pathway as well and not that hard to get to. Beyond that, it gets more difficult because those ETFs approval uh, would hinge in part on the existence of these regulated futures markets for which they're only regulated futures in the US for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Eventually, I think we'll get to the point of having uh, ETFs provide exposure to multiple different assets in the crypto market, but that's going to take uh, either some legislation or, or maturing developments of the derivatives market or other things in order for us to get there. I think if you think about what people will wrap in those ETFs, they will try everything, uh, just one asset, multiple assets, momentum strategies, hedge strategies, leverage strategies, that's what you see in the ETF world. People use the wrapper to express all these different views. The interesting thing maybe is historically the most successful ETFs, the vast majority of the market are the diversified index products. That goes a little bit against crypto's history where people own Bitcoin or they own Ethereum or they own Solana. But in the ETF market where you're dealing with financial professionals, which as Hunter mentioned, have one to 5% of their, their portfolio, maybe in crypto. What they want is crypto exposure. And so I think over time, you'll see diversified products win uh, mm -hmm. the largest share of the market. That's what we saw in commodities. That's what we certainly see in the equity space. And I suspect that will, that's what we'll see in crypto as well. I've said this, like, you know, personally, I've been wanting to do this for a while. Like, because we're so early, I almost want a constantly rebalancing index of the top 10 coins to make sure that I capture whatever is going to be in the, it's sort of like the S&P, it's really hard to outperform the S&P. Like you could have like not cared about the internet, but if you had exposure to the S&P, because the composition of the S&P has changed dramatically, and then then you would have benefited from that. And in crypto, I, I need a product like that to hedge my bias to be very focused in a particular ecosystem in my portfolio, but I don't have it, right? And so if you could have like, an, if I could wave a wand, uh, on to your point around a diversified index, it would really just be that. Just give me the like uh, uh, my ability to express. I'm long innovation in the space. I just don't know, and I'm pretty sure that the top ten or twenty by market cap is going to look radically different. Like if there's one bet that I can make with high conviction is that the top ten that you see right now in Coin Gecko is going to be vastly different in three, five, and ten years from now. I want to be able to capture that growth in the ecosystem. Without, you know, obviously I'm actively investing, but I also want to hedge my bet by having exposure to this type of product. But it, there isn't one, right? And so, or it's not as easy to, to kind of like get access to this unless you're like accredited or institutional. Or whatever. It's, tu it's tough though, Santa, because so Bitwise has the, um, one of your guys' most popular ones, right? It's the, yes, the yeah, Bit yeah. W, right? Yes. Yeah. But in, there are these coins that I think a lot of people who have been in the industry for a while would agree that there's not much happening in those, like like Litecoin, like I or like Bitcoin Cash or something yeah, like that. Like, you know, but, but that has to get included ADA there. Like, so inherently, you're buying, you know, Litecoin, but when you get the BT, Bit W because it's one of the top ones still for some foolish reason. So I don't know. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I, that, that's the thing. That, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. You know, like I, yeah. I obviously have a particular opinion on, on the top 10. I think some of the top 10 are just, it's crazy how they're still there, but they're there. And I've been there. not making yeah, yeah. money because of that. So that's the best counter argument. I could be intellectual yeah. or I could make, or, you know, as, as, what is it? Like, <laughs> do you want to be a writer or do you want to make money? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, like uh, ultimately, you yeah. know, uh, anyways. Uh, I think there's a lot of innovation and, and, and a lot of really interesting products that you can make. Maybe as a, I know Jason wants, uh, wants to throw a question to you to, to wrap it, but uh, you've been around the ETF industry for so long. Um, what are some of the things that the ETF industry can learn from crypto? Some things that, the, that it can adopt from crypto, whether it's blockchain technology, uh, atomic settlement, like just... Um, um, the transparency nature of it. I'm curious if you 
like the ETF industry is not perfect. I mean, it's been huge catalyst. It's been hugely beneficial, but is there an opportunity to kind of utilize this technology to revamp the financial industry, particularly within kind of ETF land? Yes, absolutely. You know, everyone who rides an innovation wave thinks they're at the end of history and that there can be nothing better. And that's certainly true in ETF land. The people who have operated there think we've solved the problem of how to access the capital markets. But of course, that's not true. ETFs trade, you know, six and a half hours a day. They don't trade on weekends. Settlement takes two days for many international stocks or bonds or some parts of the ETF market. Settlement takes 30 days, if you can imagine that, right? The cost to transact are dramatically high. The ability for individuals to build portfolios uh, in a tax efficient way are still limited. And so I absolutely think uh, uh, the ETF industry is just a stepping stone to a more perfect future that has atomic settlement, that has 24 seven, 365, that has individuals able to either own collective vehicles or direct index, which means own your assets yourselves with the push of a button, which of course you can do in SMAs today, but not as efficiently as you should be able to. So there are a few people who have been in the ETF industry that have moved into the crypto industry because they recognize we're not at the end of history on that one. Uh, and I think you're going to see more and more of that. I think you know crypto is where maybe ETFs were in 95 or 97, right before it really hit that mainstream point, which started to occur in the early 2000s. But I think we're going to get there and there's lots of gains still to be made. <laughs> Give the thumbs up, <laughs> Matt. Maybe we could end. Uh, I remember an episode you did with the with our research guys back in December 2022, talking about uh, your your Coinbase thesis. We're ten months later. I'd love to just hear your updated uh, thesis run. Coinbase is a public company right now. Coinbase is the same valuation as Pinterest, which strikes me as nuts. I love Pinterest. I know a lot of people who use Pinterest. But it's you, Matt, not, do you, have, you, have you used Pinterest recently? <laughs> I have not used Pinterest, but I do know I have friends who use Pinterest. Uh, but it's not potentially one of the most important financial services companies in the world, which I think is true of Coinbase. I think if you're uh, if you're looking at a company that's sub uh, fifty billion dollars, that you could imagine one day being a trillion dollar company, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better candidate than Coinbase. That doesn't mean it will be. But it means that it has a dominant position in an industry that's in an early stage of growth with exponential potential growth ahead of it. And it's executing exceptionally well. Uh, the other two things I would point out about Coinbase as an update from that December comment is they dramatically reduced their cost basis, right? They lowered their burn substantially. They had significant layoffs, which were painful, but their execution has never been better than it has been over the last nine months of the year, whether you're talking about a base or the diversification of their income stream or even their public setting and their, their lobbying, they're more effective today than they were in 2022 with a third fewer people. That is an exceptional corporate performance. Uh, and I think they're a strong leader for the industry. So uh, I could not be more excited about Coinbase. I think anyone who has a crypto portfolio that is excluding public equities and particularly companies like Coinbase is uh, is under allocated. They're making an active bet that those companies won't matter. And I'm not sure I would make that bet. If I wanted to diversify crypto, I would own my Bitcoin, I would own my Ethereum, I'd own my uh, Bitwise 10, uh, to your point, Santiago, but I would make sure I would tick this box. Because I think if you look at how well Coinbase is executing now, uh, you look at their revenue versus where we were in 2019, it's many fold higher. I think it is in an exceptional position and it's being uh, extremely well run. So I'm, I'm very bullish. Yeah. The trend with broker, the counter argument would be that the last five years with brokerages, fees have gone to zero. And Coinbase, you know, if you look at Robinhood or TD Ameritrade or anything like that, you almost jumped out of your seat. So I feel like you have a thought here. Uh, but I'd, I'd, I'd just be curious. It sounds like you think that they will be able to execute against that, that downtrend. Yeah, again, they're, they're, you know, there's there's value to have been, been in the market for a long time. The same thing was true of Charles Schwab. 
it got yeah. launched on commissions trading for twenty nine ninety five, and and then E Trade and now Robinhood commissions are zero. It's bigger than it's ever been, and the reason yep. is if you control a base of investors with significant assets, and you have a strong reputation and a high level of trust, you will find ways to monetize those users. You will find interest income. You will find advised assets. You'll find products development. You'll find things like base. Coinbase is doing that right now in front of your eyes. If you look at the share of non-commission revenue, it's been going up and up and up. And I don't understand why traditional uh, Wall Street analysts haven't taken the lessons from Charles Schwab, the last really disruptive brokerage service, which today charges zero for commissions and applied it to Coinbase. It's just so mm -hmm. obvious to me. And they yeah. control a really important market and they're doing a really good job at it. I think it's one of the most uh, misunderstood public companies out there. And, 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 you know, you talk about like being, you know, early contrarian and then eventually, right. You know, what do you believe in that others don't and eventually, well, like if, if you're excited about crypto, I, I, I would love to have a discussion with someone who's really excited about crypto and doesn't think that if crypto continues to grow in what version of the world, probabilistically does Coinbase not do better given everything that they've done? There's a lot more. I've probably about I, you, I think you'd be surprised though, Santi. I posted something on Twitter about oh, a month yeah. ago. No, yeah, the worst thing is Coinbase. I think Coinbase gets more shit amongst crypto natives and doesn't it's get remarkable. enough yeah. credibility. Like before base. Now, after base, people are like, oh, wow, they're doing a lot for the space. I'm like, yeah, no shit. Uh, but even before that, it, it was sort of like a vilified, like, oh, you represent yeah. everything that's wrong the world and traditional yeah. financial institutions. But they've done a huge service to the space. Incredible. Probably the most important company in crypto. I would just add, I think that's a really important point. I think one of the reasons it's so contrarian is the stock has a lack of natural buyers because the crypto people don't like it and the non-crypto people don't want crypto. Yeah. So who's going, who is left to buy Coinbase? But eventually, eventually value will win out. And uh, I suspect that's what we'll see. I, I, I would just dump, double down on... on... <laughs> and none of this is legal financial advice. Uh, you know, <laughs> that is very you know, true. Uh, don't go out and YOLO with the Coinbase. Okay, guys, please. I uh, I would double down on what you said, Santiago. I, I think Coinbase is is the most important company in, in crypto. It's hard to imagine the space without it. Um, they provide so many services behind the scenes, and I think that'll be more and more of their growth story. Uh, but even just setting aside, looking at them as, uh, as an investment or as a, as a corporation, um, they're also tackling one of the sort of original sins of crypto that continues to plague the crypto space, which is that crypto uh, has the worst communication problem out of any innovation sector I've ever seen. If you think about just as a heuristic, what do people want to know about uh, the developments in AI? They want to know, how can I use it? What are other people using it for? And is it going to be good or bad for the world? Those are the same things that people want to know about crypto. But instead, we tell them about mining rigs powered by volcanoes in countries that they can't even locate on a map. Um, and we talk to them about hash rate and you know ZK proofs. These are all good things, but we're talking right past them. Uh, it's like the physics professor who walks into the 101 class and alienates 80% of the class by- uh, Sir, this uh, is a Wendy's. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so I think I think that uh, that crypto has a really inspiring message to tell about democratizing access, about rebuilding trust in the internet era, um, about moving the world forward, and and not not taking the sort of state of play in 2023 as the final uh, you know progress that that civilization can make. Um, but I think has been relatively poor at recognizing that. Uh, most audiences who are not in crypto have a small amount of time and want to answer the same questions they have about AI. And I think that uh, Coinbase has done more than, than anyone, particularly in this past year, if you think about their campaigns around uh, update the system, such a simple way of conveying what I think everyone in crypto believes in, but is so rarely the subject matter of conversations. Uh, the recent campaign in, D in DC uh, about America loves crypto pointing out that more Americans own crypto than watch the Super Bowl. Again, such a simple point, um, but somehow gets lost in all of the discussion uh, about uh, the more idiosyncratic and technical aspects of the space. So I think that they do an incredible job. And I, I would also just say, 
I've, I've said this a few times, but I think it's so important to sort of having this self-awareness about the crypto space. Um, for many of our clients, we work with about 1,800 wealth teams, institutions, RAs, and family offices now. For many of them, they schedule a quarterly conversation with us. And we mm-hmm. produce a quarterly report. It can be found on our website if people are curious, but we produce a quarterly report and they want to know what happened over the last quarter. That's how much sort of time and of course they're they're watching things here and there. And of course we say there's this important development you should know about. But you know, that that sort of helps, I think, visualize the aperture that most of the public that is not in crypto has for this space. So when we have those moments, those beautiful moments where someone offers us some of their attention and time. Uh, how do we fill it? And is it productive relative to they want to know? And I think historically, crypto has been squandering that time uh, by yeah. filling it with things that they find curious or some technical detail. It's not that those don't matter. We care deeply about those. Our CTO, now in 40, you know, writes uh, comments on improvement proposals and uh, writes some of them himself. Uh, but we have to recognize the audience. Um, and I think that's just one other aperture through which I think Coinbase has un- been unbelievably important. I think that they see that clearly and yeah. have done incredible work over the course of this year to help tell the story of crypto at the same level that the discussion around AI is happening, um, which yeah. is how do I use it? What are other people using it for? Is it going to be good for the world? That's what the general public wants to know. Yeah, that's such a good point. I mean, I think uh, that's great way to end it because you know, base might be the most important development because they're going to really and they're, they're really emphasizing consumer non-speculative use cases like restaurant rewards programs and the whole campaign around base i think is going to be is incredibly exciting it feels like it, it will deliver on getting builders to to build actual products because i think that is my understanding talking to people that are close to regulators are like you just a bunch of people got lucky and then they just, you can't stop talking about this thing but show me a really useful application to this and ai is you know, farther, way farther along and and crypto has really, that's kind of our, our, has been, I think, our weakest uh, line of defense. uh, We've we've seen seen that as well. I think we put out a report maybe in April or May, Matt's team and the the research team here called the 12 real world use cases that millions of people are are using today. And it, it illustrates 12 examples of use cases that actually have traction and put some statistics and narrative behind it. And that has been one of our most popular pieces amongst clients all year. It says nothing about return potential, nothing about sharp ratios or correlations. And it speaks, I think, Santiago, to what you said, which is people, again, just want to understand these very simple things, which is how can I use it? How are other people using it? Will it be good for the world? And the way to interpret that is through understanding uh, use cases. I think base is very productive relative to that. I think, you know, conversations around those subject matter will always be very productive. And a good heuristic for people in the crypto space is, you know, uh, is this the same type of thing, same type of conversation that would be productive in AI? If you're, if you're, if you're at a dinner talking about AI, what do you want to know? How many people are using it? What are they using it for? What's it going to be used for in two years? And is that going to be good for the world? <clears throat> Perhaps you want to have a conversation about, uh, you know, hardware and transformers and how different transformers will help with the compute necessary to run uh, the models. In certain conversations, that is a productive uh, line of discussion, but most well, people please want invite to me to those because most of them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> most of the time it's you know you get that far. But we we'll yeah. definitely have to link to that report. I, I would love to for for people to to browse it and double click on it because it's so important to arm ourselves with just you know stable coins, NFTs. Uh, there there are some really good use cases out there, and I think people oftentimes lose sight of that, but they're there. And yeah. you talk to people on the ground, and they're definitely getting a lot of value, and really appreciate the core tenants and and, and applications that are there. And yeah. so, um, yeah, uh, putting price aside, uh, there there's some really useful applications out there, and people just need to be constantly reminded of that. Yeah, Hunter, Matt, thank you guys. This is great. Yeah, thanks for all the work you do. Uh, I know you 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 talk about Coinbase doing great work in DC, but I know you guys are also talking out there to you know, a lot of, a lot of the folks in the street. So really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, keep doing great work and, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hope to see some ETF sometime soon. <laughs> Thanks guys. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is, this is wonderful and, and appreciate those comments. We, you know, we, we, we try to be good stewards of the space and, and feel grateful to be part of this industry with others like you who are thinking about the long term. So thanks for the conversation. All right, Jones. Thank you.